Hello everyone, welcome to Stealing with Chantel. I'm Chantel and this is Ty. Hello everyone, my name is Floyd Miracle. I'm the clinical manager for Jessamine County EMS. So my job involves training, uh, continued competencies, orientation, and uh, a lot of our, we de also develop a lot of key performance indicators. So we measure how well we're doing uh, uh, in multiple different areas. One thing that we pay particular attention to is cardiac arrest. Because when someone's heart stops beating and they stop breathing, they can survive. Whether or not they survive depends frequently on how quickly the community uh, starts or begins CPR. So your interventions before we get there are crucial to the patient's survival. Um, so what do we expect from our community? Well, first we expect you to recognize that the person is in CPR. How do you do that? Well, if they're not conscious, so if you say, hey, can you hear me? Are you awake? And they don't respond. And if they're not breathing normally, then we want you to call 911 and start CPR. Now, this is extremely important because a lot of times when someone goes into cardiac arrest within the first minute or so, they can gasp for breaths. So we call that agonal breathing. They'll take these big, deep, gasping type breaths. And uh, we differentiate that from normal breathing that is regular, um, just like you and I would breathe right now. So if they're not conscious, not breathing normally, you need to start CPR. A lot of people might be afraid of starting CPR. The chances that you could hurt someone by doing CPR, even if they have a pulse, are infinitesimally small. In fact, you're more likely to help than you are to hurt. And there is a Good Samaritan law that protects bystanders um, from liability if they act in good faith when trying to help someone. So right now, what we're going to do is we'll demonstrate how to do CPR. So I'm going to ask EMT Wallace to come over here. So let's imagine that this had occurred um, to a family member because the chances are that if you do CPR, you're gonna have to do it on a loved one. So first of all, Sarah's gonna check and see if they're awake. Sir, sir, are you okay? You okay? So if they don't respond, she's gonna scan their chest and see if they're breathing normally. All right. If they're not breathing normally, she's going to pick up the phone, call 911, and she can put it on speaker while uh, the dispatch, dispatcher answers the phone. Then what we're going to ask you to do is you want to get really close to their side, and you'll kneel down at their level. So if they're on a bed or a couch, we ask you to move them to the floor. If they're face down, we'll ask you to roll them over. But you will kneel right next to their side. You want your shoulders to be over top of their chest, just like that. You're going to interlock your hands, or interlock your fingers. We want your elbows locked and straight and shoulders directly over the chest. And you're going to find the sternum, which is right between uh, the nipple line here. And you can feel it. It's a solid, bony portion. And you're going to take the heel of your hand, and you're going to push down hard and fast, about a 100 to 120 times a minute. So that's two compressions per second. And you want to make sure the heel of your hand comes all the way up. So Sarah, go ahead and demonstrate that. Okay, good job, Sarah. So how long would you have to do this? Well, it could be anywhere from, you know, four eight, maybe even 10 minutes. So you're going to have to do it for a while. And it is extremely important that you don't give up and you keep going until we get there and take over. 
So a lot of people ask, are we no longer giving breaths? Are we no longer doing mouth to mouth? Well, us as trained responders, we will ventilate for the patient. But what they recommend for bystanders is that you do hands only CPR. This is especially true during COVID. We don't want you to have to worry about getting uh, infected um, or getting contaminated um, by trying to resuscitate them. But also, when someone dies suddenly, let's imagine they have a heart attack and then their heart stops beating. The blood that is already in their body is already oxygenated, right? So they still have this reservoir of blood that you can circulate by doing CPR. And then by the time we get there, we will reoxygenate their blood. This does not apply to children or to someone that died from asphyxiation. So, you know, drowning or someone that was having trouble breathing before they went into cardiac arrest. It also does not apply to overdoses. It is very important that you ventilate those people as well or those victims because they died from respiratory impairment. Now, a person's chances of surviving cardiac arrest go down by roughly 10% for every minute that passes without CPR. And you can actually flatten that curve. So it's very steep if no interventions are taken uh, quickly, but you flatten that curve. We call it the slope of death. Uh, but you flatten that slope simply by doing good CPR before we get there, and you can truly help save a life. Now, when we get there, we have a lot of sophisticated equipment to help us aid in, um, in helping perfuse the brain and the heart. Okay, So when we perform compression, when we push down on the chest, we're pumping blood to the brain. When we release, we actually let that chest spring back up. It creates this negative pressure in the chest. And the heart feels and it perfuses, it sends uh, blood or oxygenated blood and other nutrients back to the heart. So we compress for the brain and we release for the heart. But when we get there, we'll do a lot of multiple different things simultaneously. Someone will take over CPR. Someone else will put them on our cardiac monitor. We may, uh, we may shock the heart if it's needed. We'll will start ventilating. So we have a device that allows us to uh, inflate the lungs to reoxygenate um, reoxygenate the blood. And we also have a mechanical CPR device. Now, if we have to move a patient, if we have to pick them off the floor, put them on our stretcher or carry them to our ambulance. It's really hard to do good CPR while we're doing that. So we will put them on a device that does CPR for us so that we can provide high quality CPR even in the back of a moving ambulance. And Sarah, let's go ahead and demonstrate our uh, mechanical CPR device. So this is the back plate. So imagine someone's doing CPR. We would then grab their hands, lift them up, slide this under, and then we would put the person back down. And we would then remove C resume CPR while she's getting that ready. Go through my arms here. And she's going to clip this in right there. And I'm going to help her out for the demonstration. And what you'll see right here, once we get it positioned correctly, this is a mechanical piston with a suction cup on the end to keep it from moving around. So we'll push this down, lock it in place, and start CPR. We can even secure the hands in these straps here so that they're not uh, so that they're not moving and then we can actually pick the patient up and move them while we're providing CPR. 
So one thing that I should specifically mention is that you can't, you're not going to hurt this person. And I want to stress that. When you push on the sternum, you may hear a crunching sound. And some people say that you're breaking ribs. Well, you're not really breaking the ribs. The, uh, the ribs are connected to the sternum by cartilage. Sometimes when you're doing CPR, that cartilage or the ribs will separate where the cartilage is. They'll separate from the sternum. And that's okay. It is extremely important for you to know that you're not going to hurt that person. In fact, very few people are actually injured when they receive CPR. So it is a life-saving intervention. So um, when someone's not conscious and not breathing normally, begin CPR without any reservations. Thanks for watching. If you would like to see more STEM with Chantel videos, check out this playlist. If you want to know when JCPL puts out more content, click the subscribe button and the notification bell.